So occlusion talks about how teeth meet in the mouth. Has anyone had orthodontics in this room? Anyone had braces as a child or, yeah? Are your teeth perfect now? <laughs> so even with, <laughs> even with orthodontics, most people will have some degree of, of malocclusion where a tooth or a series of teeth are not quite in the wrong <coughs> right position. And we see it quite a lot, don't we, with, with dogs and cats. What we've got to decide though is, is the malocclusion, is the abnormality of the teeth meeting, is it causing that animal a problem? And is it maybe an occlusion that is abnormal but is normal for that breed? So boxers, for instance, anything that's brachycephalic, it's not normal to have teeth that meet like that, but we've made it normal for these, these kind of breeds. So this is what normal should look like. This is on the AVDC website, the American Veterinary Dental College. And it's actually quite a good um, resource of information if you go and have a look around. There's information for pet owners, information for vets on there. So in the, in the front of the mouth, the incisors should meet like this. The upper maxillary incisors should just be in front of the lower incisors. The midline here should be matching the midline in the lower jaw here and there should be no abnormal contact. So the lower incisors just kind of rest on a little bump on the palatal surface of these teeth. And then if you look at the canines, the lower canine, the mandibular canine, is kind of situated at an angle a bit like that. And it rests between this incisor and the maxillary canine. So when the mouth is closed, as if by magic, the teeth fit together and they don't cause any damage because this tooth is not contacting anything. And again, you can see the lower canine, the mandibular canine, sits nicely in the gap between this incisor, the third incisor, and that maxillary canine. The tip doesn't contact any gingiva here. And then the premolars have this kind of pinking shear effect. So you can see these teeth are really well designed to be a a nice cutting tool. So the tip of that premolar kind of sits in that gap there. The tip of that premolar is sitting in that gap there. And then the carnassial in the top jaw is just on the outside of the lower carnassial there. So when you're doing um, puppy and kitten checks, it's quite important that you're checking this. It's the same in the cat. So the mandibular canine sits in that gap between the third incisor and the canine, and you can see how close everything is. It's amazing, isn't it, that these teeth know what shape they're going to be, what age they're going to erupt at, what angle they're going to erupt at, so that this mouth can close without them causing themselves any trauma. And then that the incisors are the same, the upper incisors should sit just in front of those lower incisors. And with baby teeth, with deciduous teeth, um, it's exactly the same, okay? So when you're checking your puppies, when you're checking your kittens, you want to make sure that these lower canines are not causing any trauma to the soft tissues up here. So these are puppy teeth, and you can see how long and sharp they are. That should be sitting on the outside of the gingiva here, in between that canine and that deciduous incisor. Now when you're assessing occlusion, it's a good idea to first of all check with the mouth closed. So don't go immediately to open the mouth. Um, I would recommend that you wear gloves when you're doing an oral examination. So first of all, just look at the face for symmetry. So we're looking for any kind of muscle wastage, any maybe discharge from the eyes or the nose, checking that everything looks nice and symmetrical. And then with the mouth closed, you can lift the lip and then start to look at how the incisors are meeting the lower incisors and how the canines are interdigitating. And what I normally do before I even go to sort of opening the mouth is I'll be talking to the patient, stroking it on the head, doing a little bit of bonding and assessing my chances of doing an oral examination. If the dog or cat is accepting of me stroking it and while I'm stroking it, I'm checking those things, 
I then know, is this going to be feasible or am I going to get bitten if I go any further with this patient? So spend a bit of time bonding with them before you go straight into the kind of hands-on. You can then lift the lip a little bit further cordially so you can start to look at these surfaces of um, the more caudal teeth and again keeping the mouth closed at this point okay so don't leap into opening the mouth check the incisors make sure that they meet correctly at the front and then when it comes to opening the mouth so you're probably all very good at this um, but with dogs you put your non-dominant hand over the bridge of the nose, put a thumb and your index finger just behind the canines, and then with your index finger on the incisors here, just gently open the mouth, a bit like if you were giving them a, a pill or a tablet. In dogs, you can also maybe just move the lower jaw from side to side just to make sure there isn't any discomfort or noise associated with the, the temporomandibular joint. Don't be tempted to pull on the fur I think that's uncomfortable, so just index finger on the incisors to open the mouth and just do it quite slowly and gently. And as I've already mentioned, you've got to decide, is this normal? So although this dog does not have normal occlusion, it's considered normal for that breed. Okay. Going back to opening the mouth in the cat, it's a very similar technique, hand over the top of the head, hold on to their natural handlebars, their cheekbones, their zygomatic arches, and again, index finger on the incisors. If you think the animal might have a painful mouth and you're doing this in front of a client, just warn the client they might find this uncomfortable and then proceed very gently and slowly. The last thing you want to do is just yank open the mouth and the animal screams and then you've got a client all distressed.